Hi, everybody. This is a wee bit of alchemy. I'm Rick Barrett. Welcome. Tonight, we're going to talk about a few things and uh, going to lead off with uh, some question came up about meeting and how to practice that on your own. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Gong Fu and four steps to, to Gong Fu. And, um, and then we're going to apply it into a, um, a movement from, from one, uh, one of the Tai Chi forms, uh, single whip. So if we have time for all that. So anyway, let's start with the meeting idea. And um, so meeting is a, is, is, a, is a term that I borrowed from uh, Martin Buber from I and Thou. And in his concept, that is where I encounter someone with my whole being, where I meet them eye to you. So that person is no longer just an object in my mind or a uh, something to be used or organized or thought about, but they are a reciprocal partner in the moment. So when we are meeting another, we are encountering them as a partner in, 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 in the cosmic dance. When that happens, there are no objects. There is just now. And we shift into a different state of being whenever we meet. We shift into a different state of awareness, one where it's not object-based. So in, in finding you in a world of it, I postulated one model, which is just an idea, which is that how about if we think about these things as two different types of operating systems, like computers, like you have, you have the Macintosh, Apple operating system, and you have the PC uh, operating system and um, Windows, I guess. And, and the two of them don't talk to each other very well. They're very different. They process information very differently. So you can't just pick up one computer and, and run the same processes from both systems on it, although now there are ways that they can kind of they can kind of mesh, but the uh, they're very distinct ways of processing information. So as a model, I suggested that hey, what about we think about the way we are aware in the world as two different things. One, an objective way of thinking, which is where we think representationally, that is, we come up with an idea about something, we slap a name on it, we have an experience, and then we can then say, oh, that is like this other thing. So there's a thunderstorm. So, oh, okay, that's really cool. And there, these are the qualities of a thunderstorm. This is what makes a thunderstorm unique. And this is I can then put it in the catalog with all the other thunderstorms that I've experienced. And I can tell a story about, oh, was it at a really intense thunderstorm the other night? And uh, that kind of thing. And so you can tell a story about it, which is really handy whenever you wanna to talk to other humans and you wanna uh, write things and, and, and make systems of thought and say, okay, this is a fact because a lot of us agree that this is a fact. So. Therefore, this particular story is really solid and we're gonna go with that. And those are object-based, that's an object-based system there. So these are mind objects. So then I postulated that there's this whole other way of being aware, which is non-objective, a non-objective awareness. We got object-based consciousness and non-objective awareness. And in that, there you there is just presence that is where you are present without objects where you're not thinking about anything where you enter the gap between thoughts and you uh, 
to get the gap between thoughts and you are then aware, present, but you're not thinking about anything. And you can quickly shift between the two. So in meeting, we're shifting between the two. We are aware of our circumstances, which is an object-based thought. And we have, we're also able to go into the gap between thoughts and go into that objectless awareness, which we do whenever we encounter, engage another with our whole being. And so the question that came up was, how do we practice on our own? So it's one thing, most of us have had experiences where like you're so in such rapport with another person that, oh man, this, you know, time just dissolves and, and like, oh my God, I can't believe it's three in the morning because we've been doing this for hours and it just, time just went by like that. And that's what happens in that object-less awareness, the non-objective awareness. And those things usually happen by serendipity. We just, it just sort of happens to us. And so as a result, we tend to think that we can't control it or we can't set the, up the circumstances for it. But I'd like to think that we can. I like to think that we are capable of creating meeting, at least generated by yourself even if the other person does not meet you back. And in which case you can also meet non-humans. You know, Martin Buber talks about this. He talks about meeting plants and animals at the pre-verbal level and then humans meeting other humans. And then he says, then also, then you can meet the spirit world or the, you know, those beings or being that is beyond human, that beyond form. And then you get to, there's a whole different quality there. So the question came up is, how do we practice meeting with ourselves? How do we, how do we engage that? And that is I think a really important skill to develop. It's not something, I think that your capacity to meet others will only be enhanced by your ability to meet whenever you're not being met back. You don't need that encouragement because what happens just by doing that, just by meeting, you are then able to shift between those two different states of awareness. The object-based consciousness, non-objective awareness, and you're able to, to practice moving between those two different operating systems so that you get really comfortable with it. So it's, oh, this is cool. And you also get comfortable moving to the gap between thoughts, which is the, you know, what a lot of meditation is, is about. It's about getting us to that place. In fact, you could say that meditation is primarily about practice at getting to the gap between thoughts, where you're able to suspend your thinking mind for a moment, your rational, analytical mind, yet still be present and aware. So the, um, the steps to meeting that I postulate in the book are, first thing you want to get coherent. That means move into a state of wholeness. So to meet someone with your whole being, you gotta be whole. And it's, it's one of those elusive things for a lot of people, but if you are able to access your energetic coherence on a, on a regular basis, you get really comfortable moving into that state of wholeness. Why? Because you're bringing your 
awareness to the feeling mode in addition to the, the thinking mode. And so then you're able to shift into a super conscious state. So if you just practice it with me right now, if you just want to feel your index finger, just put them in your lap. You want to point and reach with your index fingers. And feel into that. When I say feel into that, I mean actually feel your finger. And sometimes it helps just to wiggle your finger a little bit. And so you are actually activating a whole different part of your nervous system. You're accessing the sensory neural network. And it's, it's usually happening at a pre-conscious level, that is below the level of, of, of thought, below the level of thinking, that these things that we usually just get a synopsis from the nervous system arrives at the conscious mind and saying, oh, hot or wet. And that is the type of feeling it comes to as a, at a verbal level. What I'm asking you to do is to actually feel and not think about it, just feel it. And it's a different way of being. And whenever you do that, you immediately shift into a, the gap between thoughts and you move into a um, super conscious state where your body, mind, and spirit are integrated very easily, relaxedly. And you learn to get comfortable with that so that you're able to actually occupy that space for an extended period of time. And even more important, be able to shift in and out of that state so that you can move to energetic coherence slash wholeness anytime you want. This is not yet meeting. This is step number one. It gets you back to wholeness. So you are in this clear-minded state, very present, and... feeling unified and integrated. The second step goes, takes presence to an even greater degree. And that is where you actually consciously decide to occupy the present moment. So anytime you're thinking about stuff, you're not really there. You're thinking about there. So you, if you're thinking about the present moment, you're, it takes a quarter to half a second to process that through your nervous system. So you're slightly out of the present moment. You're looking at what the present moment looked like half a second ago and runs through a different part of your brain. And we don't usually notice it because it's, you know, Everybody else is doing it that way, so it's uh, you don't really notice it. But you do notice it whenever you're playing some sort of sport, say, where timing is important, where like a half a second to respond to a punch being thrown at you is a long time. If someone's throwing a fastball and you're playing baseball, 95 mile an hour fast, fastball, half a second is an eternity. And that's true of everything. Also, if you go into your head and you think about the moment when you're in your golf swing, I don't care whatever it is, you're thinking about it, you are out of sync with the present moment. You are creating a dissonance. Yeah, and so your performance drops precipitously. So we want to get present. And a presence is making a decision to be in the now. Not in my thoughts, but now. And if I'm thinking, if I'm talking, you know, there's a part of me which is doing something else. So right now, as I'm talking with you, I'm having to toggle back and forth between the present moment and talking. And so, and that's something that 
you practice so that you get really good at it so that you hardly notice. But so one way of, of uh, establishing presence, that I, a fun way that I, I've used in the past is to just ask the question, where am I now? And answer, here I am. And that here I am acts as a, a locator. As you're not locating, oh, I'm in the room, I'm talking to these people, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm in New York City. It's said, no, those are all objects. Those are all mind objects. They're part of the story. We're moving outside of the story and we're saying, where am I? Here. When? Now. And so it becomes, you're establishing presence as a, a thing which is not determined by objects. It is just here and it's now. So it's an absolute location in the present. So we have wholeness, we have presence. And then once we establish that, then we reach out. We find someone, we notice, oh, there's someone there I would like to meet, someone or something I would like to meet. And then you extend your awareness out and you locate that person that you would like to meet or that thing. So as we were talked about, it's like, you know, you can do it with the animals, the plants, you know, who hasn't had a cat, you know, and you look in the cat's eyes and, you know, the cat is just like there and you're there. It's like, okay, this is really cool. That's, that's, that's meeting you know, or a dog or whatever, but you can do it with a tree, you can do it with a mountain, you can do it. And what it does is it changes you whenever you extend in that way. This is really woo woo stuff we're talking about here. But for me, it is this is the foundation. This makes it all work. So if I meet, let's say my hand, right, there's, I can look at my hand, Hello, hand, and I can uh, I can notice it. I can notice it's the different qualities of it there, and the fingers, and all its flaws, and its beauty, and uh, its potential, and its ability, and its and and everything else about it. Or uh, so I can do that, and that's an object based thing. I'm an observer of the hand. And to be an observer of the hand, I have to be separate from the hand. Even though it's my hand, I think that, okay, there's me and there's my, my hand. And we're two poles in this terminal, which is cool, because then I get to know something about the hand. And I'd be able to talk about the hand and say, hey, this is a cool hand. you know. Um, but if I want to meet the hand, then I say, where are you now? Here you are. And in that moment of recognition of my hand as my partner in this investigation, magic happens. You know, Buber says that God is the electricity that flows between two people when they meet like that. And I, I concur. To me, that is spirit. That is where we, we ride the lightning of spirit is when we do that. But we don't have to be met back in order to make that happen. And we benefit just by the fact of meeting whether or not we are met back or not. And the beautiful thing is it will change the world around you if you do that. People will respond to you differently when they see you're doing it because when you do that you are awake you are engaged in the world in a way that is no longer somnambulism you're no longer sleepwalking through life and are just playing out old reels of movies that of your life in your head and you're you know ruminating about past wrongs that people have done to you or about the 
you know, your hopes and dreams or whatever. These are all thoughts. These are all object thought mind objects, which are beautiful. And, and we all need those and want those. But when you're in a meeting state, so practicing that, we got three steps. Get coherent. So point, reach, feel yourself into a state of wholeness. Two, get present. Even more present. Where am I now? Here I am. And it's not, you're not looking for information when you say, where am I now? You are, it is a call and response to the universe. It is a call and response to yourself. You are zeroing in, ah, here I am. And then, you know, you light up. Then you extend from wholeness and presence, you extend to other, be it animal, vegetable, mineral, human, spirit, whatever you say, you. And when, when you say you, you shift into that whole way of, different way of being. Meeting includes both the objective and the non-objective. So meeting also includes awareness of context. I mean, you say, okay, what game am I playing now? And being aware of that, the context in which you are meeting. And that's where the fun begins because now you've got, you're playing a game, you've got a partner in the game, even if the partner is a rock or a caterpillar, it's your partner. Hey buddy, let's play. And then fun stuff happens. It brings you into the present and you get enlivened in life. So would, um, is there anybody who has some thoughts, questions? Did I go on too long? Scott. Uh, I don't think you went on too long. That was that was perfect. Thank you. Uh, just a one question. Um, what about inanimate objects uh, like the couch I'm sitting on? Or, or yeah, why not? Like, I don't know. I just, did. Oh, so. I just did meet the cat. Okay, well, there you go. That's my answer. Definitely meet 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 it because you know you every everything you whenever you engage in a conversation with the world, your environment, whatever you change your relationship to it. It is no longer an it. It is you, and you bring it into the present. So right now I'm sitting in a chair and I'm meeting the chair. When I do that, there is, I'm, I'm more alive than I was before. I'm bringing mindfulness into the, into the moment. So you just, you just did it there. You just, <laughs> okay. There was, there was a, a, a change in your energy when you did it. You say, oh, click and you can meet, you know, the top of your head, you know, you say, you know, and when you do that, it changes your energy. It brings you more into now and it, it expands. It takes you into whole new places where you, um, where you, you can't get in just an object-based um, consciousness. Richard, you had a thought. Uh, my thought was just that a tree would be a good thing to hug. Tree is a wonderful thing to hug, but you don't have to hug it. You can just touch it. You can just stand in front of it. I, uh, I remember when I was practicing for tournaments, you know, I would, there's a, the oldest tree in Staten Island is, uh, just a you know five minute walk from here, in a, in a park. It's uh, and so I would go and I would stand and do a standing meditation with that tree. And 
and engage the tree in a conversation about rooting. You know, I said, I'd say, hey, tell me the secret of rooting. And, <laughs> you know, and they don't talk so much, at least not in language, not in verbal language, but I, I think I, I got I got a lot. <laughs> I, I learned a lot about rooting from that conversation that I would have. And it was wasn't just once, it was it was many times that I would that would do that. And until like, okay, all right, thank you, brother. You know, and so you are had that relationship then. It's about relating, it's about you and your environment, whatever it may be. And this exchange that occurs there, and then we put labels on it. We can say, "Oh, that's chi, or that's consciousness, or that's blah blah blah, whatever, whatever." These are all myths that we create for ourselves so that we can talk about this stuff. But what goes beyond all those myths and all those stories and all those narratives is the moment of relating, and that is where the magic happens. Keith, brother from another mother, I just got to <laughs> say, uh, you know, besides introducing me to Valerie and I met Scott last weekend, which I'm, I've been working or she has been like kind enough to like sacrifice herself to like try to show me some stuff to expand on what you did when we met in June. But with that being said, you, your analogy to, to animals and to both plants and rooting, I mean, strikes a chord. Uh, you know, growing up where we grew up in PA, I mean, my first memories were being in the garden with my, uh, your younger cousin, my older sister, Cindy, with uh, tomato plants and salt shaker. And, you know, I came to learn I've gardened my entire life. And you only know your plants only go as far up as the roots go down, you know? And everything that grows is based on how you prep the soil. And then having four dogs and three golden retrievers, uh, you know, the animal analogy is amazing. And I think I had mentioned to you, and I know I've had mentioned as nauseum to Valerie being, you know, playing music and learning to play golf. I react best to, you know, few key words versus like 83, 83 things I got to remember at the same time. So it strikes a chord and I appreciate it. That's it. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> cool. Anybody else? Any other questions, thoughts? All good. Okay. Moving on. Uh, so, so I I hope that that set up the how do we practice this? We can practice this all day, every day. Um, any any chance you get, you just, you know, just say hello to your salt shaker. Say hello to the tomato. Say hello to the tomato plant. You know. Say hello to the cat. You know, whatever you when you meet, you know, you you can uh, you just practice that. OK, the producer is telling me that we got to move this thing along. So um, next two other things you wanted to do. Two other things. Yes, it's 832. OK, so. Um, I'm going it's to nowhere near 832. <laughs> and another time space continuum. So I want to talk to you the four stages of Kung Fu. Okay, and then we're going to explore that in a uh, in an exercise. So the uh, this is the way I, I explain it to myself. And um, it not only applies to learning, say, a martial art, but learning anything or just anything you want to do in life, these four things in a sequence. And it's, it, you, you do them in the context of the whole study, but also in each individual part. And so the four steps I'm going to talk about that is, first thing you want to do is you want to replicate or duplicate or copy exactly the thing that you want to learn. That is, you are you're taking that thing in and you are as close as you can, you're trying to get it exactly as it is being taught. Whether or not it's correct or not, doesn't matter. 
get the message. And this goes with communication too. It's like, if someone is, is telling you something, you want to hear exactly the words that they are saying and exactly the way that they intend them, whether or not they are using the correct words or not. You want to get what they're saying and, and try to grasp what they are trying to communicate there. And this, this is important because a lot of a lot of people never get that part. They start to hear something and they immediately start to run their own interpretation of things. They're, they're substituting their belief system. What Joe means to say really, I think, is this, even though he's using the words that say the exact opposite, this is what he means. You immediately start to interpret by translating it to your own philosophy, your own uh, worldview, your own prejudices, your own experience. And you never really get Joe's message. You never really get the message from the book. You never really get the message from the course because you have jumped several steps ahead without doing the first step, which is to duplicate or replicate or copy exactly what's being done. If I say, take your right hand and, and raise it over your head, okay, that's, that's a very simple command. And it's like, oh, okay, I do that. And you do that, it's like, doesn't matter. Is that silly? Well, you know, how about if I use my left hand? You know, how about if I reach out? You know, there's, we start to jump ahead to all the other ways that could be rather than just doing the simple thing. And so that first step is really key to be able to understand another human being is to actually hear what they have to say. So that's the first step. So in a Kung Fu, you want to be able to get the idea that's being presented. You want to say, oh, okay, this is, I raised my right hand, got it, okay. And you do that until you can copy, but it's because the words will only take you so far. Then you have to like say, oh, okay, there's, there's more to this. Then you, you do it. So then the second step is understanding. You don't get to understanding until you have done step one. You don't understand what is being taught. You may have a better way. You may have a way from this other teacher that you learned from. And so, you know, yeah, okay, I, I don't really need this guy because uh, I've already got my, my head is already full of ideas. I don't need this new stuff, which is fine. But for a beginner's mind, you say, clear the, clear the etch a sketch. We're starting over. And you say, okay, draw a straight line. Good, I draw a straight line. Boom. And do that until I can, until I'm really comfortable with, with that. Okay, I got, got that, that message. Then you go to understanding, which is like, why am I doing this? Then you start to see in the context of what is being taught, what is this teacher what is this book? What is this video? What is it trying to communicate to me that is maybe different than what I already know? And so I try to understand it within the context of the thing being discussed. So this is, we're still in step one and two here. First you understand, you duplicate, then you understand. You can't understand until you duplicate or replicate or, or get, get a copy. Then you understand. And once you understand, you say, oh, okay, so this is what you want me to do, right? And you, you, you say, and you, you demonstrate, this is, so this is what you want here. Okay, is that, is that correct? You know, and then you try to understand as best you can. So, and the, you explain it to yourself, you explain it, you, you get as much information as you can. Then, 
Step three is judgment. You know, I know judgment has become a very bad word. We're not supposed to judge, but uh, judgment is actually kind of cool. It means that you come to an opinion about something. That is, does in this case, does it work? Somebody says, hey, you know, hop up and down on one foot. Okay, good. All right, I do that. I understand it. All right. Now, I come to a judgment. Is this hopping down on one foot thing? Is it for me? Is what I, is it, is this where I want to go? If you skip right to judgment before steps one and two, then you are judging based on your prejudices, your own ideas about what is or what should be, and you're kind of missing the message of the teaching. So we got judgment comes after you understand, after you have duplicated. Then what else is possible? After you've come to judgment and you've, you know, you've have an awareness like, okay, this is workable, this isn't workable, whatever. Like building on this, this particular thing, what else can I do? Where can I take this? And it may, that may take you back into the same exercise and say, oh, to understand, to go deeper into this, to, to understand more about what is possible, I have to go back to step one and do a better job of duplicating a better job of really getting what is being shown here because maybe I didn't, didn't get the whole thing. Maybe I've rejected it before I was able to really fully take in the, uh, the message, before I fully understood why it was happening. So the judgment part also allows you to to come up with questions about, okay, if I do this, what do I get from it? That kind of thing, which also further leads to further understanding. So then this process goes over and over again. We go back to the duplication. We try to understand a little deeper. We come to more judgment. We also then say, okay, what else is possible? And that continues over and over again. That continues, you know, forever and you the subject itself becomes is subject to that that ser series of uh, of explorations but each individual component of it is okay is that is that helpful at all yes 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 Any, all make sense anything there that needs further explanation no? Okay, good. So one of the, uh, the questions came up was, how do we, uh, let's take a, a look at the uh, a movement from uh, the um, Yang Ching Fu's 13 original postures. It doesn't matter if you if you do your Tai Chi this way or not. It, this is where we get a chance to, to explore. That is duplicate, not like, hey, yeah, that's, that's nice, but we do it differently in our school. This is like, no, no, I'm going to duplicate what is happening, understand it, then I can come to a judgment about it. Then I can explore and say, oh, what else is possible? So let's take a look at that. And I'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So um, if you do have questions, call them out and, uh, we will uh, we'll do our best to to, um, to explore it. I really want you to get the uh, get that first step, the duplication part. So to make it uh, even more uh, beginner mindy, we'll uh, instead of uh, going the, the the usual way, which would be like this, we're going to go mirror image style just so it's a real kind of kind of thing and um so we're going from um what is the movement for that we're going from uh, 
Okay, so good. From the uh, um, cloud hands. Okay, so we've uh, we're here and we're going to um, we're going to go into single whip from here and. Um, Actually, let's let's just go there. So, so feel the um, ba, 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 ba. okay. All right. So from here, you're going to um, your feet are hip width apart. Arms are reach. Your right arm is reaching out. Your left arm also reaching out, and your turn. So you're sunk into the right leg. Your right leg is your substantial leg. So you're going to feel the ball of the left foot, set the left knee, spiral down to the right. So you're starting to load up. So first thing we want to do is feel the left ball of the left foot. Set the left knee. And feel the support in that. You're going to spiral down to the right. So that means you're going to release the, the left quad spiraling down to the right. What that does is it allows us to sit down in that left leg. And then we turn, turn the waist. And as we turn the waist, the right hand comes down, the left hand comes across. And the left hand turns into a bird's beak. So the fingers come together. You bend the wrist. And you reach out. Notice that the elbow is set. You're reaching out, reaching down with the hand. So pause a moment and feel that. Yeah, so we're going to go back and your weight is primarily in the right leg. Your right leg is substantial. You're reaching out. Feel the ball of the left foot. Set the left knee. And using the left hip, the quad, you want to sit down and spiral down to the right. So you're loading up that left leg. And feeling your body supported by that. Notice my body is, is vertical. Okay. Notice my butt is not out to the side. I'm releasing down, sitting down in that leg. That allows me to freeze up my hip joint. So now what? I'm going to turn very slowly so you can feel that. When I'm turning, what am I doing? I'm reaching with that left elbow, feeling my fingers. Left hand forms a bird beak. Turn to the right. Sorry, turning to the right, reaching out with the left arm. All right. Boom. No, no. We're turning the body to the right, and you're reaching out with the left arm that way. that way. So we're going, boom. Bring your right hand with the palm up. Feel that. Let's go back to the, back to here. So we're duplicating. 
We're, what we're doing, we're feeling into that right foot now. Feeling the right, right knee, settling into that right leg. We're gonna change, we're gonna feel the ball of the left foot. Set the left knee, spiral down to the right. And then turn. Left hand forms a bird's beak, right hand. So it's almost like they, you have a cup of water there and uh, the, the bird is going to drink from that. Turn the body, reach out with the left hand. So you're turning the body to the right, left hand reaches to the left. Spiral down, feel the ball of the left foot, set the left knee, spiral down to the left, sink in. Right hand comes up and step with the right foot. And reach out with the right hand. I'm sorry, step, step with the right foot, keep your hand down there. We're not gonna do the other part till next move. And then that's gonna go like this, so. We're feeling that ball there, reaching out with the hand. So there's a continuity in the structure. Back to here. So we're back to the duplication. This each time through, we get a little more understanding. So we feel the ball of the left foot, set the left knee. What's that going to do? It's going to enable us to turn. So we each time we go through this, we enter it with that same beginner's mind. What am I doing? Is this the best way to do this? Did I get, am I able to duplicate it? Ah, and then we turn and reach. Left ball, set the left knee, spiral down to the left, pick up the right foot, pick up the right heel, and you're gonna step out with the right foot. Left foot. Right foot. Left foot. Your, your, your right foot is stepping out. Not if you're mirror, we're mirroring you, right? You're mirroring, okay. So then you're going to feel the ball, set the, set the knee and reach with your right elbow and open. So you feel into that. And then from there you turn. And feel into that. So each step of the way we're, we're exploring what is possible there. We're Looking at each each time we do it as if it's new. Okay, one more time. So here we are. Feel the ball. So um, I'm doing this mirror image style here. So it's uh, I'm going to the ball of the left foot, set the left knee, spiraling down to the left.
Feel the ball, set the knee, feel the ball, the left foot, set the knee and turn. Reach out with the, right, the left wrist and the left leg. Feel the ball, the left foot, set the left knee, spiral down to the left, pick up the right heel and step. Feel the ball, push your knee out, set the knee, reach with the elbow. Feel your structure opening and bring your hand up. Yeah. Turn and rotate. You know your single whip. Okay, so that was fairly complex movement and further complex, complicated by the fact that we did it mirror image. And I did it specifically to accentuate this is something new. Even if you've done this before and you, a lot of you have you've done it before with me, it's still, I mean, for me, it was new when I was trying to talk about it. It's like, oh, how do I do this now? I haven't done this in, in a few weeks. Oh, you know, it's, I'm like, you know, to be able to not just do it, be able to talk about it is like, it's, it's brand new. But when you bring, when you meet it, when you bring your new eyes to that moment, your beginner's mind, what's happening is you're, you're no longer going out of memory. You shifted into a super conscious state where you are having to climb into your nervous system and dig out the, um, all that pre-conscious stuff that we did, just tend to just turn, turn out as an algorithm. And you're saying, no, no, we're gonna bring this, we're gonna make this alive. We're going to bring life into it, and the this runs counter to the the brain's normal tendency, which it likes to simplify. It likes to reduce everything down to as the simplest components it can, and we're running opposite of that that tendency. And we're saying, no, no, we're we're not just trying to convert things into simple algorithms. We are actually changing our brain, changing our nervous system by engaging this at the, at, at the level of, of the code that it's written in. And we're going in and we're, we're becoming part of, the, part of the living matrix there as we, as we do that. And we're taking over control over things which have a tendency to go to um, Automatic. So uh, we could just got a few minutes left. Any questions, thoughts? Keith. Okay, I purposely did not participate for the reason I am such a newbie. And I can tell you after two months of Saturdays with with uh, Valerie, uh, I have I have learned or I don't even say I've learned. She has shown me the first two of the original 13, whatever, 18 movements. And I don't want to get about over my skis. So I purposely did not participate. Okay, that, that, that's fine. No, no worries. But, but, but uh, I don't know. Should I, is it cool? <laughs> I don't know. Because I mean, she because I mean, she showed me and she showed me like from her mindset she's going to spend this time in teaching the first three or four movements. And then until I perfect them, she's not going to take me any farther because there's Good. no reason to. Good. So I, that's why I don't want to get over my skis. And that's why I sat down and just watched. Good. Good. Very well. Anybody, Scott. Um, yeah, I never got to left style. So it's completely new to me. And yeah, definitely, you know, there's new neural pathways growing in my brain, I think. Good. So, yeah, definitely. 
Definitely. It was, it was a lot to it. Yeah. Good, good. And it was, a lot of it was just a, an opportunity to explore what I was just talking about there about those four steps, you know, and we definitely got to what else is possible by doing it on, on the other side, by doing it in mirror image. We said, like, oh, okay, this is, this is new. So then you, you get to explore new possibilities. So it's not just a, a, another pat formula, do this thing for this particular, this as a prescription for this thing, do this type of breathing for your, you know, your nervousness or whatever. You say, like, no, no, this is about exploring the very essence of Kung Fu, getting it so that you can, you can apply this to anything in your life. Cool. Uh, anybody else before we go? You turn me on, Ricky Dog. <laughs> Stan, do you have something? Yes, uh, Rick. The only thing I could say is uh, we need to do this like uh, maybe uh, not next time, but uh, fairly soon. We have to do it one more time. As uh, I think I was getting it partly and then it seemed to be going wrong. So I think we like to try it or I like to try it myself around another time like that. Sure, sure. It, it, it certainly, it's one of those things that we, the, the purpose wasn't to teach you teach you a whole move so that you would then master it. It was to explore the dynamics of the, you know, how to learn these things, how we can actually go. And what do we do? We copy, we, we try to get it so that it's, we get it exactly as it's being taught. We come to an understanding, we come to a judgment. We then are able to then go and explore something new. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, cool. Thank you. What's that, Dennis? Do you have something? Yeah, I kind of hate to bring it up at the end. It's kind of a big topic, but maybe we can talk about it in the future more. And it's the whole idea of time. You've talked about in some of your books about how Tai Chi slows time down. And a lot of this, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I've been thinking about it after you talked about the pendulum and the pendulum being zero time. You know, when it reaches the end of the pendulum. Well, there's really no such thing as zero time. Time is infinite. You cannot have zero time. There's always, there's always, it's mathematics. There's always, a, there's an infinite number of points between any two points. So when you reach that point of zero time, you're really looking into infinity. You're, you're right about that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and also, and, what I was saying was zero duration. Zero to, right, right, right. But I mean, it's, it's not like zero time. It's, it's zero duration. Well, so that, the, that's, the way I like to think of it is, is that it's, you, you reach the point of, of, of zero mass, it's weightlessness. So it's zero mass and zero and zero time. You're looking at, you reach the point of infinity and zero mass, which I think is kind of cool. But it's, it's the whole concept. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like you disappear, you know? But it, the whole it's idea of like that. Time, is that you have this slows the concept of time down you know like like you do a ward off it seems like it's just two moves you step and you wave your arm but the more you learn it there's all these different steps in between you know you you're you, you do your opening move you've got it down to 15 15 steps well that takes place inside of three seconds right you know there's you know, there's so much that you're slowing down I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole, I guess I, I hate I, to bring I, it up at the end of the class. <laughs> I, I, I agree. Uh, let, let, let's uh, bring that up, bring that up next time. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll throw that into the hopper because uh, <laughs> that is, I think it's an important discussion to have. So, because mm -hmm. uh, time is one of those really um, um, yes. interesting topics and people have a lot of opinions about time. And so it's, uh, I think it'd be good to explore some of them. So uh, on that note, I well, bid you, did, what's did, that? Did Nick get his answer? Oh, Nick, me? did you? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I did. Good, <laughs> wonderful. Thanks, okay. <laughs>